Stand on your feet and just put your hands up in the air as high as you can get them. Come on. Now, a little bit higher. Come on. You can do it. Oh, you just, you just don't know what you can do until you really want to. God bless you. What a wonderful time. You can put them down. I mean, it looks like I got you under arrest here. Um, you want to get to the dinner theater. You need good fun. You need good food. And you put those two together, and you'll get a really good thing that's happening. I want to get there, and I will. By the grace of God, one of these nights soon I'll get there. Because I like to go just to laugh with them, and they're the funniest people. And Not funny, funny, you know what I mean, but they're just funny. They, they make you laugh, and everybody needs to laugh because that's like better than medicine. Can I get an amen? amen. Um, now, I see one of my families from the, uh, from the school come in today. We're, we're glad you're here today, and I, I'd like to get at the end of the service, I'd like to get, just get a chance to meet you and, uh, and say hello to you, okay, in, in, uh, in person. It's difficult to see right here like this, so uh, I want to learn... And all your little machachitos are here with you today. Uh, and a uh, great place to be in the church service. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, honestly, I'm not going to preach today. But I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell you the truth. I want you to listen because your life is getting ready to be changed. And here is what he says in the 43rd chapter, or did I say 43rd, or did I say uh, 43rd? I said 23rd, didn't I? 43rd and 19. And what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to, I would like to, read it from the scripture and then I might just add some some more not add and take away but from another version and I have it I always carry about 20 versions right here and I can do it very quickly but let me read first of all from verse uh, 19 I want that this is not Isaiah talking Isaiah is giving the prophecy but it's God who is talking through him. And this is the way the prophecy came. As, a, as he blew his breath upon them, the ruah, it becomes the living word of God. You have to understand that. And that's why it's different from anything that uh, one of the evangelists or pastors say. It is different because it is God's holy word. Behold, I will do a new thing. This is a new king, champs, almost like the other. I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness, and I will make rivers in the desert. And other versions, like the message, he says that he's going to clear out all of the coyotes and the owls and any kind of uh, buzzards that are there. And he's going to take dry ground that had nothing on it whatsoever. N no, nothing but dry, parched earth. And just like that, he's going to let a river flow from the waters that are way up above because he's going to open the floodgates. Now, we are going to be ready when he opens the floodgates to say, Lord, I'm lifting it up a little more in my life so that I will... Receive what you've got for me. We're, he's in the giving. And we're in the receiving end. And that makes us ready for it. In Jesus' name. Thank you very much. You can be seated.
He said, don't you know it? Don't you perceive what I'm doing? He says, I have done a lot of great things. I'm going to paraphrase for him for the other parts of this chapter. I've done a lot of great things. I have led you out of Egyptian bondage. I have led you toward the sea, and I made the waves part and drag around for all two million of you to, tr to, to transfer over on. And immediately I made the waters come in together when all of Egypt's soldiers and pharaohs and his armies were there. And I caused those waters to drown them. Now you can say, well, is God in the killing business? And I don't think so. He's in the saving business. But he let the waters come over those people. And they weren't looking for Israelis anymore. They were looking for a lifeboat. God knows what he's doing, and I'm saying that part right here to you, that many of you, some of you in the congregation have had some things from the devil that meant to do you harm, that came after you like a bounty hunter, like a dog. But he's going to allow you to have freedom and he's going to end that problem in your life. I, I do not know why I'm drawn to this. Again, I mean this. But I'm drawn to this right now because I know some of the problems probably. To let you know that he's going to make a way in your wilderness. It's my talk to you. I'm going to make a way in your wilderness, he says. And I will make rivers that go through the desert and I will lead you on to greater victory. Now you will find this again in the 29th chapter of um, Isaiah, this very same thing of Jeremiah, excuse me, of Jeremiah when he talks about the plans. So just hang on with me and let me bring it to you step by step. I think some of us have settled down to think that God can only do one thing and then after that it's over. Because you pray and fast and you deal and then he does the one thing you say, thank you Lord, I'll take that and that's it. You can go home now. But generally, one thing that God does always leads to another. There are blessings in heaven that are waiting for you if you will learn how to open heaven's floodgates. They're there already. The blessings are not for God. That's not what he's looking. The blessings are for you. He says, do you not perceive it? Here's your mind again. Do you not perceive this? Do you not know? In other words, He's saying here, so you can find it in other versions, but I couldn't read all of them. Don't have the time to do that. He's saying, are you, I've already given them, but are you making room for it in your own thinking? Are you ready for the floodgate to open in your life? Now, God wants to bless more than we want to receive, I believe. And he has blessings that are piled up in heaven waiting for somebody to reach up and open it up and say, Lord, it is mine. Once in a while, you will do that and come across that little shower of blessing. But he has a flood waiting for some of you, for any of us who will dare to take what he says. I believe he wants to do it more than we want him to do it. And I wonder if it doesn't weary him the way we are so slow sometimes about receiving what he's given to us. Now, in ages past, 
They didn't have glass. Whatever they could get to hold something was generally metal or some type of stone. Or some type later, they realized you could do it out of leather. They would make a jar out of the leather or the skin of an animal, like a deer. They could tan it, get it soft and pliable, and with skilled fingers and hands, they could get it set up so that it would set up right there and it would hold anything that they needed. Often when you think of jars, you think of a ball jar, but that's not what they had in Israel or in the Bible. They had stone and they had leather. Leather was normally used on little things, just a, just a little one, maybe a quart, maybe a half gallon or a gallon. But it would be difficult to find it where you'd have, unless you had seams or you got an elephant to make something that, <clears throat> that big. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but when you take the leather, if you've, if you've ever been around tanners, you take the leather and tan it and get it just right in the sun, make it just like you want it, and then you have to let it harden just like you would concrete or anything else. Or, or mud. It's the tanning that I want you to look at today. And I want you to know that within that, in that skin, that leather, there are ingredients that will stay there for many, many years. And these ingredients will keep that leather pliable and to most things uh, un- or impenetrable. So you could carry along a bottle of water or whatever fluid or juice that you were carrying. And so when you hear Jesus talk, who referred back to what I have just read you, he said, and, and you can find this in, um, in the Gospel of uh, Matthew In Matthew chapter uh, 9 and verse 17, he says, You cannot put new wine into old wineskins. Now, obviously, you know me enough to know that I'm not here today to say, Go down and get you a quart or a gallon or a pint or whatever it is. I'm not saying that. What I want to give you is the biblical way Jesus said that the wineskin was used. When you have new wine, you have to put new wine into a new skin. And if you don't do it, you're going to have a mess before long. There were some who believed that you could. But after that wineskin has set up, the wine will keep on working and fermenting. You do know this much, don't you? I know you do. I can see it on your face. And it will keep on working. You may be asleep, but it's working. And it's swelling. And it's increasing. And it's multiplying on the inside. It begins to churn. And the molecular structure of that wine that the natural fermentation is happening to. It'll happen with grapes, blackberries, blueberries, dewberries, just apples, it won't matter what it is. There is in it the natural way that it will, um, it will begin to uh, work itself. And then when you put that wine that's just been made even though it's reached, uh, I don't know how many days it takes to make it, 20, 30 days or 10 days, whatever it is, when you put it in that wineskin, um, it will continue to work. That's why the wineskin has to be pliable. 
Should you take the new wine that's still working, it hasn't reached its age yet. It's still working, and you put it in that old wineskin, you're going to get a real first-class mess. Now, I know this to be a fact. I am not a winemaker, but I have always had a passion, especially in my early days, for root beer. Now, I had a friend who's already in heaven who introduced me to Faye named Glenn Bailey, whose dad was a preacher, and he passed on when he was working with Emmanuel College in Georgia. I went to do the, did the funeral service a few years ago. Glenn was from up north in Ohio and places like that. And he said, John, I know you like it, but this stuff that we drink out of those bottles, that root beer, said, that's nothing at all. He said, have you ever had hires? I said, no, I never heard of it. So he went one day right at the grocery and got me a little bottle of hires. And now you're all going to go hires uh, flavoring about this big. And he told me how much sugar to put in and how much water to put in, then put the hires in, and the hires would begin to work it. Now, you don't leave it long. You just leave it so that it begins to get just a little bit. You don't get it to where it's got alcohol in it. That's against us, okay? But you get it just to the point where it begins to have a little more of a taste and have a little more oomph to it. You can find it some places along the road where you get the, they'll say that it's kind of natural root beer. Well, I did it for the first time. I wanted to see if I could do it. We were living at 205 Andover Road, right behind Joe Knowles and Doris, right in front of uh, John Klutz, and uh, they were all around us. And I said, well, I can do it. She said, you're going to make a mess. Faye's always been very careful about making messes. Well, I, um, I, I did everything like Glenn Bailey told me, except one thing, I got the wrong bottle. He said, get the Pepsi-Cola, the Coca-Cola bottle, the two-liter size. And I did. But did you know that back then, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they used to make those bottles out of thin glass. Plastic hadn't come along to where we have those things now that you can mash them all up. They were thin glass, and then they had a heavy glass one, if you recall that. And you could get your deposit on those heavy glasses. I didn't get the heavy glass. I got the thin glass, I did it, and I put it, he said, make sure you leave this much space at the top. I did it exactly. He said, make sure you leave it four or five days. I did it exactly. Well, it left me in four or five days because it would happen on a Sunday morning just prior to um, the time that I'm getting ready to go and preach at the great church, Northwood Temple Church over there. And all of a sudden, we hear an explosion like some terrorist has hit our house. I have six or seven of those, five or six of those bottles with the thin glass in our storage room. And they are waiting to get just a little bit nippy so that it would be good to uh, root beer. And just at that point, it reached a point where it says, I'm not waiting for you. I'm going to blow right now. And it expanded. And it got to the place and bam, just like that, it was gone. Mother Noel stuck her head out the door and said, have you got a, something going on? Are they fighting you? I went running. She said, uh-oh, I told you it was going to get you. And I went out to the storage room. And just as I got there, dangerous. Another one blew up right in front of me in glass and root beer and everything covered all over me, all over the little storage room right there on Andover Road. It did it. Well, she said, enjoy cleaning it up, John. I hope that the root beer is worth that. I managed to salvage only one or two of the half bottles. They were gone, and I quickly poured them out, and I said, what on earth happened? And someone said, you put it in the wrong bottle. I put it in the thin glass bottle that would not give, that could not take the pressure. Jesus said, you be careful how you take an old wineskin, thin as it is and cracked up as it is, and put new wine or new anything in it because it's going to tell the tale as soon as it starts working and going. And you're going to lose it. 
and you're going to blow everything up the kingdom come. Now, I want to tell you, Jesus must have known something when he said that. He must have known what would happen because he knew all of the processes and all of the molecular structures of grapes. He says, if you get it there and then you put it there so that it will, it will ferment, and they did reach the fermentation there, I can promise you, it was light or dark or medium or whatever it might be, white, I, I'm not sure of any of it. I just know this. He said that if you put the old, the new wine into an old wineskin, you're going to blow it up. Now, he was really saying this about the spiritual things that he had to offer and the condition that the people around him had gotten themselves into because they had old wineskins and thought they could put the new wine that he was giving and going to give into an old wineskin. The day that he stepped out at the feast, when they all went to the feast and came back and left that uh, temple that day so downhearted and disheartened, dead and empty because they just didn't have it. He stepped out and he said, you're getting ready for something great. He says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and let him drink. And out of his innermost being, he's really saying belly, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And this spoke he of the Holy Spirit, which he had not given at that time in John chapter 7. You read it yourself. Uh, he said that if you do this, you've got to have something to carry it in. Jesus puts it all together. If you're going to have the new anointing of the Holy Spirit, you had better get yourself all fixed up and ready and tanned. And you'd better get the right vessel to put it in. Because you may not be able to undergo the transformation that is going to become necessary for you to take and make in your life. Some things are going to happen when you open up the floodgates of heaven. You're not going to be the same person that you were yesterday. When the Lord starts moving on you and me, he moves in unprecedented ways. And God is wanting me to tell you, this church at Northwood Temple, and all of you who are on Facebook and in the parking lot, God wants me to tell you that he is wanting to give you an anointing of the Holy Spirit and that there are blessings in heaven that have been kept there because you would not get ready to a point where you would receive those things. You're putting it in a plastic bottle, and you ought to get the right kind of jar or the bottle so that you are able to handle the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Can somebody understand what I'm saying today? Do you understand? Go ahead and clap your hands. It's fine. I want to know that you understand. Look, he wants you to be anointed, and you can't handle it unless you're willing to change on the inside. And that takes some doing, and it doesn't come by him. You say, well, bless God, if he wants to change me, he can change. He's not going to do it. You're going to change yourself. No wonder those people went into the upper room, and he said, you tarry there. He didn't put a date on it. He doesn't have to put a date on it. He didn't say, go there and tarry for 10 days. He said, you go and tarry. Now, you and I like to put dates on it, and we like to say, well, at 5 o'clock, on uh, Sunday afternoon, it's going to be my D-Day, and I'm going to receive the blessing from God. You're not going to get it like that. God wants you to know that you don't put times and dates and destinies on him. You come to him, and he will give you the time when the time comes. And you will know it when he comes down on you with the anointing of the Holy Spirit when he begins to pour the new wine on the inside of you and that new wine begins to flow to those around you and you receive the blessings of God. Now, oftentimes we think that the blessings of God are just uh, uh, monetary. But oftentimes the blessings of God are more than that. They are spiritual blessings that God has for you. But you're more interested in the monetary blessings and the monetary gifts than you are, we are in the, um, in the spiritual things. There are spiritual gifts that God wants to give you if you are willing to take one of them and prepare your heart. If it takes one day, that's it. If it takes two days, that's it. It may take you ten days. It may take you three months to where you get, a, you get to the place where you consecrate yourself. Consecrate me now, Lord, in your spirit. 
so that I am ready to take on what you want me to have. Now, what is it that God wants you to have today? And how willing are you to say, Lord God, I pray that you would anoint me with the power of the Holy Spirit. And whatever you have to do, Lord, just keep me from blowing the kingdom come. I don't want to be like that root beer that Pastor fixed when he was a young preacher. I don't want to be like that. I want my body and my heart to be able to hold it so that I'll have more and more about Jesus all the time. And I can keep on doing his will. I can keep on praying, keep on praising, and keep on ministering. Now, when the spiritual gifts come... And the monetary gifts come. They're all directed toward him. It's not for you to say, well, I did this. And, and God didn't have anything to do with it. I made the money. I worked at the It's not yours. And you'll find out about it when the ambulance comes to get you. Or when the hearse comes to take you down to the cemetery right there on the Ramsey Street. You're not going to take any of it with you. That's why I urge you to plan. I urge you to give. I urge you to invest. I urge you to let use the blessings of God so that you turn it into blessings for other people and begin to help them. Can I get a witness from somebody? God wants you to be a blesser. But sometimes we're afraid to do that. We say, it's mine and I'm going to keep it. What's mine is mine. What's mine is yours, God. And he gets every bit of it. Sometimes we miss the greatest blessings in life that he has for us because we're just not ready with the right kind of wineskin for him to pour the anointing of the Holy Spirit in. When we, when we get ready, uh, we're going we're gonna to stop missing all the things that God has for us to take. He's got a reservoir. It's dry in your territory. It's dry in your home. It's dry in your, your life. And you say, Lord, I'd, I'd give anything to, would you, to have the blessing like that. It will come when you dedicate yourself and you get ready for it. We just sometimes aren't ready for it, and we want God to pour it out heavy upon us with that great reservoir. God has some plans for you. Are you ready for the plan? Are you ready for God to touch you? There are some of you who have been praying for something to happen in your life for many, many years, for many weeks or days. Get ready. God's going to pour the wine into the wine skin that is prepared for him. You have to get ready for it, though. Let me throw a name at you, Tara Holland. Tara Holland was from Missouri and Kansas in that area. Tara, Tara Holland, do, you may not remember her name. I wouldn't either if I hadn't read it. But in 1997, I think it was, she became Miss America. For two times before that, when she ran, she was one of the runners-up. Was always standing there waiting for him to say, and now, and, and miss it every time. But she decided that she was not going to miss it anymore. She was going to change her goals and have a new perspective on life. So she had a plan. She rented all of the videos that she could get of these uh, pageants from little baby girl pageants to junior pageants to Miss Teen, Miss World, Miss Universe, Miss whatever it is. She rented those things, and she looked at them. And each time, the one who had won would walk down that runway or whatever you call that gangplank that they're going to walk down. When they walked down that, she would say in herself, and she told this in her biography. She would say, I'm being crowned Miss So-and-so that day, Miss Universe or Miss Teen or whatever it might be. I, it's me that's walking down that plank. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have it. 
and she watched the Miss America ones, and she said, it may look like it's for them, but it's for me too. She watched every young woman crowned a winner, and Tara began to picture herself in a place where that girl was. Receiving the crown was going to be something that she would do one day, and it's going to be mine, she says, my crown. Each time she saw them do this, she would say, Lord, I thank you for letting me win. So when Tara was crowned Miss America in 1997, she took that long walk down that runway, as natural to her as it was for breathing. Afterward, they interviewed her like they do sports people and all. And they asked her if she was nervous about the crowning, here are her words. No, I wasn't nervous at all. You see, I had walked down that little runway thousands of times before. She said, and I believe that one day God was going to give it to me. Now, how do you picture yourself today? Are you going around saying you ain't nothing? You, you, you ain't no count? Don't say that again. You're battling your bold property. Individually and awesomely made. God made no other person like you. No fingerprints. No skins alike. No eyes have the same color. Everything is different about you than anybody else. Stop knocking what God has given to you and use what you've got for the glory of God. And you become what God wants you to become. God has given you some wonderful things. He's placed them upon us. And I believe some of those things that he's given us are like what he promised that the Lord would give you to Timothy when he wrote to him in 2 Timothy 1 and 6. And the New Living Translation brings it out so beautifully when he says, Timothy, and in the midst of what he was saying, sandwiched in there, he says, fan into the flames the spiritual gift that God gave you. Now that when I looked up a number of times, and when I got to the message from Peterson's message, he said, you keep that thing burning. Don't let it go out. Now God might help you start a fire and give you the gift, but you and I have got to be the ones that keep it burning. He's not going to keep it burning. He wants you and me to keep it burning. And when he said, fan into the flame, he's making a picture of you when you build a fire in your fireplace or when you light the grill or when you make a campfire. You either fan it or you, you blow it. And the more oxygen that you send out to that fire, the hotter it's going to get. I saw the extreme done one night in one of the first churches, little churches we were in the country. They were having hamburgers and hot dogs. And they didn't think they had the fire hot enough at the grill. And these country boys all of a sudden, one went in the house and came out with an electric fan this big on the back of it, the cord and everything. I said, what's he going to do? And he got right down on the charcoal fire and turned that baby on. And all of a sudden, it turned from fire to white. And in a couple of minutes or less, he had that charcoal so hot that it would melt steel almost. all because he learned to fan the flame.
Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, you have to fan the flame that God has given to you. Now remember he said in there in 2 Timothy, he said the flame of the Spirit and the gift that God put on you, he said this. You can read it in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He said you can fan the flame that came to you, the burning coal, when I laid my hands upon you. I'm not making this up. When I laid my hand upon you, and God imparted to you these spiritual gifts, Timothy, I, I may not be with you all the time, but I've got to tell you that the secret to being what God wants you to be and stay is for you to treat him like he's a God of today, yes, but also like he's a God of tomorrow's. And we can sing just as I am, and that's wonderful. But it's really a little better than that. It's just like I'm going to be. Because as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Understanding the English there and the Hebrew will help you to understand that in that statement that he's making, he's giving an infinitive. And that simply means that that's something that had not a beginning and nobody knows where it came from and never will have an ending. It usually has a T-O in front of it to give, to be, to do something. To become. I haven't reached it yet, sir. I'm becoming. You see, not me, man. I ain't, I'm righteous and I'm the only one around. You're missing it when you do that. You're becoming something. You're becoming something more and more every day. You're adding to it all the grace of God and all the blessings of God. And if you are the same today that you were 20 years ago, you've been missing something. We're climbing and climbing and climbing up Sunshine Mountain. We're going with him and taking everything that he's got to give us. So when God blesses you, say, Lord, you've given me this, and I'm going to reach out and take it, and I'm going to keep it. And if, because I know how embers do, if you leave them alone, they will die out on the hearth. And the next morning, you're going to have to get up and light the fire again. The time to light the fire is when the embers are still hot. Now, if there is anything whatsoever burning on the inside of your soul today, you fan the flame. Blow on it. Get a funeral home fan or get the electric fan and put on it. And take the gift that God has bestowed on you. And you go and do it with all of your soul, all of your heart and might. And whatever God wants you to do, you do it for his glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up, everybody. Can we affirm the word of God today? Can we just thank him by clapping our hands and for what he does for us? Do you know him as your Savior? Do you have him on the inside of you? Or do you think you're just going to just ease on into heaven and nobody's going to know about it? It's not going to happen that way. There are spiritual gifts that God has begun to give to some of you in this congregation. You know it as much as I do. You know it much more than I do. Some of you who couldn't do anything a few years ago, now you, you can do almost anything. Look, I've just scanned the audience real quickly. I skimmed it, I guess. And I see people that couldn't do anything a few years ago. Didn't do anything. Now they can do anything. 
you say, you're just making it up. No, I'm not. I could go personally right now. I could start calling names and show you. I could show you that people who didn't do anything can now stand at a door at a funeral and can make that funeral go smooth at a church or at a group. I can show you people that couldn't go anywhere, greet anybody, now can say, I want to go and see that person in the hospital or in the nursing home. I'm looking at people right now who would have cringed a few years ago if we said, would you go and lay hands on that person so that they could be healed? <laughs> no. I can't give anybody anything. And now they just reach out with their hand because they know that they are blessed. Again, as I've said it before, Diane Wheatley, look at your hand. That hand that you've got, that's changed lives, it's changed people, that's changed people in this community, in this area. Look, that hand, if you start feeling it up here, that's a thud. That's not very much, is it, when you start doing that? But get on down to the fingers right here to the ends. And in this hand, You've got some power. And most of the things that you do or ever will do are done with his hand. That's why we say it's a long arm and hand of God. That's why we say we'll reach out and touch you and lay hands on you. That's why Paul said, Timothy, he didn't say, I laid my foot on you. He said, I laid my hands on you. There's power in those hands. I've seen some who wouldn't even go and pray for somebody, go and pray for somebody, come and say, they got healed. You just don't know what you can do until you fan into flame what God has given you. God has blessed you in great abundance. Let him keep on blessing you. Don't stop. If you aren't saved, if you aren't born again, this would be the perfect day. Look, you don't have to go far. You don't have to go call the fire tower or anything. You're just right here. Ask him to come into your life. You say, yo, you got to go and do something, climb a staircase, walk over glass. Walk through fire. You sure get saved then. <laughs> you don't need to get saved if you walk through fire. Swim that pond. Give so much. Be the leader in this. Go to Sunday school till you got a string of pins down both sides. Never miss. That's not going to get you to heaven. You go to you. You do these things because you're going to heaven. You can't do those things to get to heaven. He's already done it. He's already done it. I'll never forget the young man that came flying to me saying, Look, Pastor, what can I do? What, what, I want to get saved. What can I do to get saved? I said, nothing. He said, nothing? What do you mean? And I said, there's nothing left for you to do. Jesus paid it all. He's already done it. Look, I watched a man right here, second row. He'd come two or three Sundays getting a little hungry for the gospel for something that he didn't have. And I said, today, God wants to come into you, just like I'm talking right now. And that man with his mustache had already said, he said, when you look at me, you're looking at the meanest man in Cumberland County. <laughs> I mean it. I said, geez, ooh. That day he raised his hand and said, I want Jesus. I said, now, Lord, that's a big job for you, not for Jesus. He stepped out. Another man stepped over and joined him right there. And he prayed. And he never looked back. Put up all those other things, his ways of life and everything else, and let Christ do the guiding. When he would come from then on, 
He sat over here on this side. And when he died, we brought him right down here. I'll never forget what I said to him that day that, you know what I mean, when I stood by the casket. I said to him, Billy, Ricky Escott, rest in peace. But then I said, keep on going, son, keep on going. And I know Billy Graham and him said, when you time you get to 70 or 80, you don't accept Christ. I never believed that. I believe that the devil wants you to think that if you don't get it when you're a child, you're not going to get it. Look, I'm telling you, I've seen people 70, 80, 90 years old get saved. You don't go so far that Christ can't save you. He knows what he's doing. He specializes in people. Especially in putting his hands on people that he's not supposed to. When no one else would touch that leper, it says, and Jesus reached out and touched him. And in that hand, those fingers, those nerves, God used them. Same way he did when Jesus, in talking about wine and the wine skins, says he was walking along and then there came a leader of the town and he said, my daughter just died, but if you'll come, she'll live. Jesus went and she lived. But on the way, another woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years under the doctor's care got worse. And Jesus stopped and said, your faith has made you whole. Look, God wants to forgive you. I can't tell you that enough. I'm lingering because the Lord wants me to linger just a little longer. They've already done what they're going to do with the other Facebook and everything. But if it should pick you up, and you'll listen to this maybe a year from now, you can get this, of course. You can share it with somebody if you'll just share it today from your Facebook. Somebody who's close to eternity. And you could let them hear what I'm saying right now. That you don't get so far away that Christ can't find where you are and come to you. He'll find you every time. And they'll have a party time in heaven. Because this, my son, was lost and now is found. That's God for you. Do it now. And bow your head with me, if you would. I mean, in Facebook and here and out in the audience, wherever you are. John, I'm, I, I really feel that once I had it real good, but I've got a few doubts. So I'm not warm as I ought to be. My colds are getting worn out. My colds are burning out, John. Pray for me, will you, pal? Just ask me, okay? I just want it to be something from you right now. It's your time to preach. Come on. I want you to just say, John, Pastor John, look, remember me. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up. Go ahead and do it. Oh, praise the Lord. I see the hands. Go ahead, others. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm telling you, I know that God is here. I don't understand why he's making me say what I did. I'd left out the other part. It's okay. But for some one of you who has just raised your hand, I want you to know this. I've been praying for you already. <laughs> I've been on my face and on my knees about you and saying, God, now let's finish the gift, Lord. And may this person fan the flame. You fan the flame. Go ahead and fan the flame. Fan it by reading your Bible. Fan it by telling somebody about Christ. Fan it by getting in a group and letting us train you, letting us teach you. You've got much to give. You, are, you have so much to give. And I pray that you will do it in Jesus' name. 
There may be somebody here today who can say, well, John, I'm, not only am I sliding back a little bit there, but I've never even been saved. Will you pray for me as a hand could be raised? Uh, anyone? I want to lead you in a prayer. I want everybody here to say it out loud with me, would you? Dear Lord God, I come to you and ask you to help me to fan this flame because I want to be a live coal on the altar. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me and make me whiter than snow. Make my desires right and give me favor, Lord. And bring about my request, not only spiritually, but physically too and financially. I pray, God, that you would let it come from heaven. Lord, we open up the floodgates. And now I'm going to ask you for a different prayer that I wrote. I'm not much on writing prayers, okay, but I wrote one for you here. And, and I want you to say it after me. I'll go slow enough so you can say it. But I want you to say it out loud. Everybody here. If you get anything in it that you can't agree with me, just pass it over. Dear Lord God, you know how negative my mind and thoughts have been toward you. But you know how I have wished I've been unwilling to release the floodgates. But now, Lord, I want to release the floodgates and let the water from heaven flow through my desert, make a river, send me your power. I'm willing right now to reach down and pull open that gate that's been blocking my season for many years. You have blessed me. Say it out loud. I want to hear you. You have blessed me and my family with abundant blessings. And sometimes I've taken these for granted. I pray that you will open my mind. And I will begin to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Help me to understand what you meant when you said, if you will only believe, all things are possible unto you. I believe that you have a new wineskin for me. I pray that you will let me have those wineskins today and get them ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and let me come before you, a God of holiness, holy, holy, holy.